Hello and welcome to Deco Stop from the Deep Sea Podcast. We spend a lot of time gazing at the abyss, and so maybe it's time that the abyss gazed back at us. In these special episodes, we, well, turn things around a little bit and look at the scientists for a more human centric episode. This episode focuses on eco-anxiety. Uh, it is something that we've all certainly felt and we know our listeners do. They've often written in to talk about it. We're currently in the midst of an ecological crisis, but eco-anxiety is something of a mental health crisis in response. It's all tangled up with a lot of issues that cause us to lose hope in the future. We're working longer hours, but we can't seem to afford to live well or to own a home. People who want kids are deciding that they can't afford to have them or that they don't want to sentence them to an unsure future. And... Yeah, everything's just feeling a little bit tough. This episode has been in the pipeline for some time and it's become far bigger of a subject than we were ready for. One thing that did become apparent during our research is that this is a dangerous subject. It is something that can do real harm. These are very raw feelings. People are having a hard time with this and we don't want to tread clumsily into the space and do any harm. So the priority is your safety, your health as a listener. In a very low point, uh, myself, somebody once said to me, maybe you will save the world, but you need to be here to do that. And to add to that, I'd say I have to be in a good mental state and I have to have the strength and resilience that that's going to take. So it wouldn't be a deco stop without some oversharing from me. I used to have a philosophy of good people in bad places, which was a little naive, I think. But when I was young and passionate, uh, say, you know, you wanted to improve animal welfare. I used to believe that the, the best way to achieve that would be to be a vet in a slaughterhouse, to get right at the very front line where you could make the most difference. And there certainly are people who are strong enough to do that. I've sort of known volunteers and emergency responders and counsellors who seem to have the level of mental strength that that would require. But I'm not sure most of us have that. And I think a lot of us would be harmed or burnt out quickly by that kind of situation or maybe even become hard as a coping strategy. And so you're no longer achieving what you went out there to do. You've sort of walled yourself off in self-defense. As a newly minted marine biologist, there aren't many jobs that you can get without experience. And the ones you can get to gain that experience tend to have a high turnover for exactly the reason I just mentioned. They tend to be seagoing environmental survey, uh, maybe marine mammal observations and uh, fisheries observers. And they can be fantastic careers. You'll get a huge amount of experience. You could be at sea for the majority of the year. You learn how to work with other people who may see things differently from yourself. You might earn a fair bit so you can really hammer out that student debt. I managed to, to wipe my student debt uh, during this time. They are good jobs. Some people love it and make it their whole career, but it does have a high turnover. People are burning out quite rapidly. These can be hostile environments where you can feel an unwelcome roadblock to the people you're working with. You know, there's a lot of different goals, should we say, in these in these lines of work. And you can often be seen as, a, as the police, as the enforcer, as, as somebody who's getting in the way. And there certainly are plenty of stories of people feeling unsafe in these environments. But then just as many stories probably of amazing friendships coming out of them. I went down the field environmental scientist path and I got a huge amount of experience in a short space of time. I was spending over, well, spending on average 220 days at sea a year. I got to travel to some amazing places. I made some lifelong friends. I had some excellent stories, but I was also threatened by clients, harassed by crewmates and would often return totally burnt out. I did believe in what I was doing, but it took a lot out of me. So it was tough, but I thought I was I was fighting the good fight. I liked that I was using the science training that I'd received at university in a very practical way. I used to talk about it as the sort of where the rubber meets the road. You know, it's uh, you can be very academic and sort of isolated within the university culture. Or I wanted to get out there and actually sort of use some science in, in the real world, I felt, and, and to sort of make a literal change. So eventually I felt like there wasn't much fight left in me. It did burn me out and I didn't want to take up that spot on the front line uh, if I didn't have the energy to do it right anymore. I didn't want to become maybe a bit walled off in self-defense or, or to look for a slightly easier life, you know, let some things slide. I wanted to, to finish while still being, uh, well, still being me, I guess, still not bending my, my ideals too much. I was certainly known for being quite strict and there's a few wobbly pipelines in the North Sea where uh, I've had a say. 
<laughs> and moved some things. But it wasn't about being on the sidelines and, and wagging a finger. It was about sort of engaging. You know, I was driving a petrol car, so I was totally happy with the with the oil and gas industry. I just wanted to put myself on that front line where I could maybe make it better. I don't think I could have changed it at that time, but I could nudge it to being the best it could possibly be. But eventually I knew I always wanted to come back with that real world experience and come back to research. I got hired at Aberdeen University after meeting Alan and uh, deciding to get into some deeper sea work. And I was hired on the Coral Fish Project, which was an EU project. It focused on the cold water corals, also known as deep water corals. Uh, back in the early days when we were being surprised by how common they seemed to be, they were turning up in lots of deep sea places we hadn't really looked before. We were realizing they were an important habitat type. Some of these deep reefs have been growing since the last ice age and individual colonies could be up to thousands of years old. And they're usually so deep, they were kind of self-protecting. It wasn't really an issue. But then as fishing moved deeper, they were now at more risk. As you can imagine, corals are pretty bad for nets. So they would first do what they call trimming the trees, which was to drag heavy chains across the reef to clear path for the nets. So uh, quite a horrific thing to imagine uh, if you're a a bit of a hippie at heart, which I certainly was. So these reefs that had existed since the last ice age were, were just being steamrolled for a couple of trawls uh, and then they'd kind of be spent. Um, the project actually worked with the fishing industry. So again, like I'd had worked with oil and gas in order to try and make things better, this was working with the fishing industry. And it was gathering data on the reefs to show that if they enhanced fish stocks, if they actually it was better, even purely on a financial aspect without any sort of ecological dressing, if it was worth maintaining these reefs purely for maintaining fish stocks. So I found myself in the front line once again, a tricky spot where I'm trying to work with people with a lot of different views and trying not to get too angry and emotional and actually listen to and understand the issues that other people were facing. It would have been counterproductive if I'd allowed my emotions to take over too much. But as we'll see when we talk later, emotions actually may be a part of it. Maybe I've overtrained myself to, to bottle them up a bit too much. So a few times during that period, and, and to be honest, through my life, ego anxiety has sort of become overwhelming. Uh, I've found myself in sort of some darker places. And, um, and yeah, it's tough. It is really tough. So I, as part of a learning experience, along with all of you, I'll talk to some people who might give us a little bit of grounding on what we're feeling. I won't go too much into any practical advice because I think that's that's so specific to places. It's about what you can do where you are. And, it, and it's so specific to where you are. You know, back home, hedgehogs are rehabilitated and looked after and there are breeding programs, whereas here in New Zealand, they're killed on site as a damaging invasive species. So there's no single answers. People and situations are just too varied. So this is going to be mainly about sort of self-reflection and why people are feeling this way, how people made sort of changes, how they maintain sort of their own health and stability through these times. So without any more waffle from me, we're on to our first guest. I'm joined by Dan de Klerk, co-founder of Nomadic Permaculture. And actually, it was a, a colleague of ours that put us in touch with you that she took a sustainable life mapping workshop and both really enjoyed it. But she said she really enjoyed your perspective and the resources you shared. So we wanted to have a little talk on our eco anxiety episode. So just to give a bit of grounding, could you explain a bit more about the project and its goals, Dan? Yeah, thanks for having me on, Tom. Yeah, basically, uh, Nomadic Permaculture started quite a few years ago, uh, my partner and I were doing some permaculture design work uh, in our suburb where we lived in South Africa in Cape Town. And um, yeah, just trying to get some traction there. And what started off as just a few consults here and there became uh, an opportunity for us to travel around and get to see a lot of different environmental sites and whether it was businesses or communities or just homesteads where people were trying to live in a more sustainable way. And basically our first goal was to just go around learning as much as we could. So we did that for, for some time, almost a year. And um, slowly it, the learning turned into a bit of bit more teaching than learning. And uh, we started to help people 
on their journeys along the way. And basically, wherever we've gone, we've ended up yeah, helping people on their journeys, doing a bit of teaching, doing a lot of learning. And eventually, it became some online courses, so teaching people about permaculture, how to design their homes, their lives, their businesses in a way that is yeah, more sustainable, better for the earth, better for themselves. You mentioned in your on your website that the the journey began essentially in Bali in 2012 was there was there something that sort of changed your life really was there was there a single point that uh, that set you on this journey yeah absolutely um i was studying philosophy and psychology in south africa and pretty much you know i was in not a great space you know which is part of what we're talking about here right eco anxiety yeah i was sort of getting quite dismal about the state of the world and a lot of the academic sort of solutions seemed very convoluted and theoretical and it wasn't really enough for me to sit back and just study things instead of doing things so i took a break from studies and went over to bali and ended up on a farm i didn't expect it but it was a permaculture farm and um, i spent two months there just living with these people who were doing something completely different to what i'd ever seen before and yeah it completely changed the way i saw things and it, and it seemed to me like a, a really good practical solution to get involved in so yeah that's where the journey started how would you define permaculture what what sort of sets it apart that's a that's a really tricky question. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's probably one of the hardest things um, that people are ever asked. Uh, even once they've gone on the permaculture journey for some time, it's always the question of how do we even explain what it is because it's so it's such a different perspective to what we're used to hearing about. But it basically started with Bill Mollison, um, I think in the seventies or even before that, looking at farming really primarily and seeing how farming is damaging the surrounding ecosystems, but also it damages the land that it uses to a point where it, it doesn't efficiently produce food anymore. So basically the conclusion was, well, farming is completely unsustainable, which means that you know, civilization is doomed, which was not a new idea, but... Um, we do like to think about being doomed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it was, uh, you know, we've known it for a long time, but uh, yeah. yeah. So his solution at that time was to um, take a very holistic look at things. And, you know, he was talking about sort of transdisciplinary study. So looking through the lenses of all the different fields of study instead of just being focused on one agriculture as, an, as a solution, but rather, okay, what about town planning? What about engineering and architecture and every different type of, of design? And also looking back to the to the past, you know, to the way that other people have lived before us and basically come up with a new way to, to provide food to people. And that was the start of it. And um, it sort of developed and evolved because the sort of things that he was coming up with were more than just um, solutions to farming. They were solutions to life. You know, it was completely, well, yeah, we've got our food, but how do we change the way we build our houses? How do we change the way that we get from place to place? or how we exchange goods and it just became more in depth than just um, agriculture so what was once like permaculture was once permanent agriculture it became permanent culture <laughs> and basically it's it's a tricky thing because a lot of people see the examples of what people do in permaculture and they think oh that's what permaculture is it's like you live off grid or you live with the community and you grow your own food and that's permaculture lots of composting yeah, lots of composting. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got all this image of like, you know, beautiful hippies out in the out in the wild trying to live off grid, which is not a bad image, but it's not actually the vision of permaculture. The vision of permaculture is a lot stronger and deeper than that. Basically, it's a challenge uh, the way that I see it is the first question is what is sustainability and then how do we achieve sustainability? How do we design our lives and our culture so that we achieve complete sustainability, a permanent culture, basically? And if you can satisfy those conditions in your life and in your house and in your business and in your community, and if we can all do that, then obviously we have a sustainable culture in the world. We have a permanent culture in the world. We have sustainability. So that's really the challenge of, or the vision, the vision of permaculture is this challenge. Let, let's design our lives. Let's design our our homes and our businesses and our communities so that we satisfy the conditions of sustainability. And all these things, these examples that we see of people living off grid, these are people who have said, yeah, this is one way to satisfy those conditions. It's not the only way, but this is one way that we can do it now, today, already. 
And it's not a singular sort of pass fail thing. When, when people sort of start to get overwhelmed and wonder what they can do, like three people trying their best is probably doing more good than two people who are 100% lifestyle committed. You know, it's about doing, doing what you can in the, in the situation you're in. Absolutely. Yeah. I see it as like people who are doing anything are they're joining the conversation and we don't actually have all the answers. But the more you are doing, you're, the more you're contributing to the conversation. And then we can all work, work off of each other and redesign and rethink of how we're going to design our lives and live our lives. So, yeah, every little input that you have or every little thing that you try is adding to that conversation, basically. Do you think living completely sustainably, do you think it's an achievable goal at sort of the global level when there's, when there's just so many of us? Do you think if, uh, enough of a culture shift, it is actually possible with this the population we have? Well, I think that this is the thing is that at the moment, there are quite a lot of big systematic things that need to change for us to be able to have that kind of shift. And really like the that example of people living off grid or in a community or whatever, yes, they are completely sustainable within themselves and their community, but it's not something that can be applied to the whole world. Not everyone has the ability to do that or the capacity or the resources to do that. So we're a long way from being able to do that. So that's why these are just one example of what you could do or what some people could do, but we need more solutions. We need more people to try different ways to satisfy those conditions for sustainability. And, you know, there's so many different ways that people are doing that. And there's so many different things that you can be doing and trying that, you know, it's only a matter of time until we until we start to see the needle shift, I think. Mm -hmm. And you, you're right that there's these very big, very stable institutions that will that will need to change. And one of the frustrating things I'm finding is sort of people wanting to move in this direction, people wanting to make the right choices, and solutions are kind of sold to them. As, and it's not really a solution. Do you know what I mean? The sort of greenwashing. People are, are given are given options, but they're not really options. Mm. And so I like this this sort of self sustaining element where you can. It's your own work. It's your own. Uh, it's your own sort of providing. I, I find it a real shame when uh, when the sort of people are seduced by uh, by sort of marketing that it's like actually if you look into it it's not it's not that good. It's just some clever packaging. Yeah, yeah. There's definitely a lot of greenwashing and false solutions there. Eh? Yeah. Most on your website that you say it's sort of important to to start small and sort of build into this lifestyle. Is that an important thing so you, you don't sort of get overwhelmed and burnt out? It is a it is a journey. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to me, you know, there's actually when I'm just talking in general to people, because I would never I would never sort of say, hey, look, permaculture is the one size fits all and everyone needs to jump into it. Like what my hope is to sort of expand the idea of what permaculture is so that it's actually it doesn't have the same connotations that we have of it of, of these people living off grid. So we can we can actually move away Away from that idea. The more important thing I think is to look at your own life and look at all the different parts of your life where you are having an impact on, on the earth. And you can sort of audit what your impact is on, on the world and you can set up realistic commitments for yourself. So realistic meaning, yes, like you say, something that you can manage, something bite-sized, something small, something that you can achieve. So yeah, I think that is always the first step is, is knowing what your capacity is, knowing what your resources are, and then being able to plan around that. Yeah. And sort of building on those little levels. I think the beginner level is sort of just making a choice. You know, you, you're still you're still going to, to purchase a product, but this is from a, a local dairy and I can return the milk bottle or this is in a, in a plastic container and it's been shipped from a mega dairy further away. Yeah. I feel like those little junction choices, it, it shouldn't impact you too much financially. There's a little bit of extra work. I've always got to remember to bring the bottles back. Yeah. But once that becomes habit, then you can start on the next thing and you can build on that. It stops feeling an effort once it becomes routine. Yeah. Well, I think it is important to think of it like habits. I think one of the things that's, that's tricky, I think, and that breeds sort of this eco-anxiety can be that if you don't have a plan, if you're not planning like how you're going to slowly change one step at a time, then these things sort of come by on a whim. So you're out at the shop and you're like, oh, should I buy this product or that product? And there's that moment of anxiety and it's like, oh, it's painful. This is more expensive. Do I know if it's actually something that I can afford to be doing? If you haven't actually taken the time to plan it out and think about it, you've got all these decisions that you're just making on the spur of the moment. And, you know, the same applies. You're, you're looking on 
on social media and something pops up and it's like, oh, oh no, there's another disaster. Now I need to do something about that. Or, oh no, like this thing that I've been doing is also really bad for the environment. Okay, maybe to that, tonight I'll shower for shorter or whatever. There's like a billion things you could be doing. And if you're making that decision just in the spur of the moment on the day, I think that's going to breed a lot of anxiety. So I think it's more important to look at all of the different impacts that you're having and get an idea of you know what each part of your life what impact it's having on the on the planet and then think about all the different changes that you could make and then yeah choose the one so if it is that you've you've landed on using a local dairy supply and refilling your bottle there if that's your chosen habit then just let that be the one until it is a habit until you have the energy to spare for something else because i think the overwhelming sensation and the sort of paralysis is i don't know when you almost feel too much or, or you aren't sure where to begin and actually turning that anxiety into any form of action in the right direction can sort of start to alleviate it absolutely yeah I mean, emotions are, are not disorders, you know, they're there for a purpose. They're there to guide us. It's like, oh, you're anxious because you need to be doing something about this. So great, do something, but have a plan. Because if you don't have a plan, it's just going to be all over the place. And, hmm. you know, you won't get things done. You won't form habits and the anxiety will just increase. So do you feel there was obviously a point in your life where, where sort of eco-anxiety weighed on you very heavily? And I also think you were, it was interesting that what you were studying because you're actually quite equipped to understand those emotions and, and sort of approach them as a philosophy. Would you say that now you're sort of driven and you've, you've managed to conquer that anxiety or do you still feel it's there as a, a bit of a driving force? Um, it, it'll always ebb and flow, I think. You know, there's no... If you don't have a little bit of anxiety, at least from time to time, then I think you've got your head in the sand, really. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's the truth is it's a, it's a dire situation. So, of course, we're going to be feeling all kinds of strong emotions um, whenever we're paying attention to, to those outside things. But, yeah, it is a personal growth journey. You know, life is always going to have some kinds of challenges and anxieties. It's, it's always been that way even without climate disasters at hand. And one of the awesome tools that, I, that I've that i picked up that I enjoy, um, which I think is pretty relevant to this discussion, is uh, the circle of control, the circle of influence, and the circle mm. of concern. Basically, um, if you were to sort of write on a page all of the things that might concern you, that might have an impact on your life, you'd have a million things written down right you could draw a big circle around them and say this is my circle of concern these are things that can impact me and affect me so it's everything from you know what your friend does to you to what is on the news like big stories on the news it's got everything in there but there's a smaller circle inside there that we call the circle of influence so this is things that we have a pretty decent amount of influence over whether intentionally or unintentionally so this is like our friends and family our immediate circles we have an influence over them, but we can't necessarily control them. We can't control our friends and family. So they are outside of our circle of control, which is now the last smallest circle. So you have these three circles, big circle of concern, smaller circle of influence, and the smallest circle of control. The only things that we actually can control are basically our own actions, the things that we do. And so productive and effective people and balanced and happy and healthy people, they focus mostly on their circle of control. Um, almost entirely on their circle of control because that's the only way you can get things done. It's the only way you can actually stay on top of your emotions, use them effectively. If you are spending a lot of your mental energy on circle of concern that is not in your circle of control, that's when anxiety comes up. That's when helplessness, feelings of helplessness come up. And um, yeah, you become very paralyzed and unable to do anything. So we need to know what our circle of control is. We need to limit our circle of control to things that we really can handle. And um, yeah, that's basically what it is. And it comes back to what we were saying earlier is like, look at all of the impacts in your life because everything, all of your actions are within your circle of control. So look at all of your actions, choose which ones are having the impact on the earth that you want to change and um, slowly change your actions within your circle of control. I think that was a brilliant summation. Oh, that was really, really good. And I think this is something that has changed more recently 
as we are far, far more connected, the circle of concern is huge and, and yep. people call it doom scrolling. And I can, I can see very, very upsetting things that I've got no control over. They're on the other yep. side of the planet and I have an opinion. And if I can do anything, I will, but I am losing a lot of mental energy and causing myself a lot of distress mm. for something that I can't, I can't actually control. I can't actually sort of deal with. Yeah. It's not an easy thing to do. I think it's just one of those challenges of life that we all need to face is that but have the grace to to accept the things i can't change and that's that's all to do with the circle of control and circle of concern another one i lean on is um i think it's a quote from a, a u.s president but it's uh, do what you can with what you have where you are Mm, absolutely. That's very good. And it doesn't mean you don't care about those other things. It doesn't mean sort of walling off your heart, but mm. but you can channel that energy into the things you can control. So a, a, a mass bleaching event in the Great Barrier Reef will upset you, but the thing you can do is one of the changes to a lifestyle that we've we've touched on today. Absolutely. And it's, you know, that also makes me think of, you know, when you're on an airplane and they tell you about the oxygen masks dropping yes. down and you need to put yours on before you help the other person. That's the thing is like if you are constantly caught up outside of your circle of control and you're just focusing on things that you can't control you're not actually doing anyone any good mm. so the first thing to do is look at your circle of control yeah don your own mask before helping others which sounds selfish but you you are then a liability if you've not looked after yourself first you're then somebody else's job exactly that was brilliant thank you dan that was really good fun <laughs> cool thank you tom I really enjoyed the insight from Dan. I probably am guilty of deciding a lot of things in the moment rather than planning ahead and therefore not feeling very in control of my actions. I think you need to have something achievable so that you know when you've succeeded. I can't just be thrashing about doing all I can, burning loads of energy, and I won't know if I've achieved anything unless the earth is saved. That's probably quite a big thing for one human. And so part of coping with the anxiety is that kind of feedback loop. I am going to make this change. I successfully made this change. Yay me. Rather than looking outside, is the world fixed yet? No, then I guess I'm walking. <laughs> so, so I quite like that. I quite like that. That feels much more achievable. And you get to celebrate your victories. You know, we, we all lose in the end. So uh, you've got to celebrate your victories when they come across. And that can be even very minor things, but we need to have a goal that we know when we've achieved it. So we can get that little, little endorphin buzz and that little tick box. So look after yourself, understand what you can change and what's eating your mental energy and make a plan with those achievable goals, which actually seems pretty broad and reasonable life advice. I really love the circle of influence. I think that's a great way of thinking about things. I have started, and I know a lot of people have started actively disengaging from my phone because I can expose myself to plenty of things that will ruin my day and there's nothing I can do about them. You know, there's plenty of content that's designed to give you that emotional hit and there's there's nothing I can do about it. You know, often that's something that's already happened. It's like, this thing has already happened, now feel mad about it. Uh, and so I've started to disengage from that a little bit, trying to uh, focus on that circle of influence and where I can make a change and it makes you feel so much more grounded. You know, you, you can't, you can't engage with the world on a global scale. You know, sometimes you just need to be aware of where you are. Remember, put your own mask on first. So following on from those thoughts, we we'll talk to our next guest, Brian. I'm joined by Brian Burnerman, a wellness coach, facilitator, podcast host, and co-founder of Conscious Action, a collective that encourages people to make meaningful and achievable changes in their lives to help the planet. And their goal is to inspire and empower people by showing that they can have a positive impact on the world, no matter how big or small. A conscious Action is based in New Zealand and hosts events, retreats, and workshops and collaborations. Thanks so much for coming on, Brian. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me here. Uh, it's a pleasure always to, to connect and to be able to share some of my experience. Brilliant. It's exactly what we want to hear. So to jump right in, part of your motivation for, for starting Conscious Action came after attending a, a documentary screening about the world's problems. It was sort of an overwhelming uh, sense in that moment, I, I feel. And then seeing the audience leave, feeling overwhelmed, and you felt that too. And you've gone for a more sort of gentle and in inspiring approach. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, definitely. As, as you're saying, I went to see this documentary, Plastic Ocean, uh, which 
if someone hasn't seen that, I really recommend for them to watch it. And as you're saying, the documentary ended. I was living and I was hearing the conversations of people just outside waiting to, to go. And they were all really depressed. It was very negative how they left, uh, their outlook of things. And that's when I thought there was such an amazing opportunity to actually have a conversation now that people know what are the issues, then how can we actually use that to understand what can we do individually and as a collective? What is possible? What is something that we can, in a sense, turn it around, at least from the negative aspect into conscious action. And that doesn't mean a lot of times, you know, to go all out and to, and to change our entire lives and to be activists uh, or whatever that, that means, really hardcore things. It's just understanding what is the action that each of us need to take that is the next right action for us. So uh, I focus a lot on well-being and that is the well-being of the individual, of the collective, of our environment. And when we understand all of these different components, then it is easier to understand how to be and how to make decisions in our lives. So it is not just a, a one-size-fits-all action taking it's about understanding what's the right action for each of us. And that action might be doing nothing as well. <laughs> yeah, not, not exhausting yourself on, on things that are ineffective. Resting and recovering when, when you need to. Definitely. You spent a couple of years at a, a Tibetan Buddhist retreat center in California. And you describe how that introduced you to a, another way of living and being. And, and a thread that's come up with a few of the people we've spoken to is our idea of what we brand as negative emotions and negative experiences being just that being negative. And so we wall them off and we're missing out on a lot of human experience and we're missing out with processing things. And is that, that the sort of pivot that you found? Yes. You know, for, for me, one of the things that led me to the Buddhist philosophy of life and why I ended up moving to that retreat center in the middle of a mountain around the redwood trees, um, that was because I wanted to explore more about my experience. And as you say, there's a lot of different ways of exploring our feelings, our emotions, our experience. And the way that I grew up with, I was in a sense repressing a lot of my experience, not looking at it, um, just, you know, shoving it down. I wasn't actually exploring the depth of my experience. And, you know, it's okay to use, as you're saying, the word negative, because we still need to sometimes share, categorize, label experience. How can we do that and at the same time allow us to, to experience things without a, a judgment? So, you know, if I have a feeling, I could look at it from, oh, this is positive or this is negative. And also I could look at it from a, there is just a feeling, there's a sensation taking place. Can I fully feel that? That can lead me to being able to actually process my experience. And one of the things from a Buddhist perspective that I was drawn into was loving compassion. And when, when we have compassion and when we understand that compassion, and that can be for ourselves and for others, when we understand compassion, we can see that compassion allows us to fully feel something and to be moved to act. So instead of going from a reactionary perspective, we go from a responding perspective. And the way that I like to separate those are reacting comes from an unconscious automatic behavior. Responding comes from a conscious decision. So when we're able to see that most of us, we are actually living on autopilot, we are not choosing how we are reacting to life, then we can take responsibility and choose to actually go into our experience and then see what is the right choice or right action at this moment, you know, so having more informed decision making. Yeah. And, and quite often then you, you unearth the, 
the causes of certain feelings and you have a much greater understanding about why you are feeling that way. And you're far more effective in, in working with those, those emotions and what they're telling you. And um, when it sort of comes to, to making choices, I, I realized as well that I'm, I'm quite often making choices in the moment in the sort of I could buy this product or I could buy this product or I could go to work on foot or I could drive and I'll be there a little bit quicker and I'll get more done. And when you're sort of talking about decision making, it, it seems to be part of the conscious drive seems to be more more having a plan and actually making those decisions long term rather than than in the moment. Yes, you know, there's you could see it from that perspective. And also, especially, you know, like from a Buddhist perspective or from a perspective of being more mindful, it is also about living in the present. And when we are living in the present, the present also expands in terms of how much time we have to make a decision. And of course, when we are able to go and like open the lens and go bigger and zoom out, we can actually see that, yes, there's ways that if I plan ahead to potential futures, then I'm, I can actually make certain actions and make some decisions that I wouldn't be able to make in the moment. I really like the idea of the present expanding. And, and once, you, once you fully live in the present, it is not measured in seconds. It is a wider realm you can influence in that immediate moment. Yes. You know, like we, we know from different perspectives that time is a construct. And it's all about how we experience it. Like, I'm sure that you or everyone that is listening, you've had experiences in your life where time seemed to go super fast or that time seemed to go super slow. So what changed? Like the, you know, our regular linear time actually kept on going second by second. Our experience is what changed that. That is what we can do when we are more present. We can actually allow time to expand and to consciously choose how we're living in that. So in your workshops, you, you try and help people define actions they can take in their, in their daily lives to help the environment. Are they unique to each person? And, and could you give a, f a few examples? Yes. You know, like one of the things that I encourage all of the time to everyone is to, to think about what matters to them, to do things in a sense individualized. We need collective actions. We need to come together. We need a lot of things to, to create changes in the systems. We need to understand what's our role, what's our place in all of that, and what's the right thing for each of us. When we understand that, and this is something that most people don't know because we haven't been taught, you know, like to actually understand what do we care about? What are our values? What are the things that we stand for? What's my energy levels? What does my possibilities, you know, like which kind of privileges do I have? What is the resources that I have access to? When we don't understand our circumstances, both from a more internal perspective and an external perspective, it's more challenging to take actions that are aligned to us and that feel a little bit in a sense easier or more flowing. So I had, you know, like some of my students at the university or through the workshops that I run, I had people that their action while I run some of these uh, sessions is to go uh, to a farmer's market instead of to a supermarket. Other people to walk, wants to work instead of always using the car. It doesn't matter really with the scale a lot of times when we're talking about individual actions at the beginning. Then there's a place and time for some people that they might have the connections or the talent or the skills or the ability to, to expand and to connect and collaborate and to, to make things bigger. And this is where I find a lot of times that our individual actions do matter. A lot of times, you know, people feel apathy and feel a lot of times that, you know, it doesn't matter what we do individually because this, the issues that we have in the world are so big that what can I do? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because it matters for each of us as well as we can have an impact on the people around us. And we don't know who around us has actually the capacity to change something in a bigger scale. So sometimes, you know, when, when we see what's going on in the world, it can seem so big. And this is why I focus on the individuals as a whole being and trying to understand what is going to be an action that is conducive for you to still stay 
well and not to burn out, not to do things that are completely out of alignment, not things that you all of the time are driving yourself to zero energy. This is where, you know, we, we need a balance. And of course, things are important. We need things to to change and to, to go to a different way of doing things. We need to understand our individual needs as well. Yeah. We, we, we've all got a limited amount of, of energy and we sometimes look at our sort of score of how well we're doing by how much of that energy we can spend. And mm. you're right. Everyone has different skill sets and everyone has different opportunities based on where they are in their life and in society. And sometimes you can exhaust yourself on the things that you find difficult, like, you know, public speaking when you're a shy person, mm -hmm. when actually because of your position in life, you have things that would make a big difference, but actually cost you not much energy because it plays to a talent or it plays to a situation you're in. And it isn't, the goal isn't to exhaust yourself doing the most you can possibly do until you burn out. It is effectiveness and, and, and internal kindness as well. It's got to be a long-term sustainable. You, you can't, you can't exhaust yourself and collapse. A lot of the sense of when you were talking about sort of tailoring what we can do to the individual and, and what our situation is, I think the the worry is when it's sort of all consuming, you, you worry about all the things you aren't doing. But I think that sense of community and realizing what energy and what capacity you have as an individual, yes, I am focusing on this. And there is this other equally good goal over there that I, I don't have the energy to, to help with right now. But if you look to your side, there'll be someone within the community who is focusing on that thing and is diverting their energy to that thing. Yeah. And you know, like a, a lot of times I do feel like I, as I have learned a lot in, in these spaces, I, I like, I want to do everything. I want to help change everything. And I know like I don't have that capacity. <laughs> I don't have the tools. I don't have the skills. I don't have the know-how for so many things. Yet I can find what is that I do well and how can I encourage more, you know, like the work that I do. It's an interesting balance a lot of times of allowing and creating change, of feeling and being curious and reflecting with taking action. An acceptance of the things that are beyond your power without sort of punishing yourself for that. Direct that energy where you, you can have influence, but you can forgive yourself where you wish you, you did have more. It needs to be sustainable. You need to, you need to look after yourself as well. Yes. Th this is one of the things that a lot of times on space of sustainability or environmentalism that I, I haven't seen enough is the importance of mental health needing to be an integral part of the climate crisis strategies, how we actually create equity, care, awareness, taking into account that we all have our past experience, we all have our traumas, we all need to deal with our well-being, whether that's full like well-being or mental health. We, we need to understand the intersectionality of all of these things that are taking place in the world. It's not like a lot of times really simple things. It's really complex what's going on in the world. We are complex beings. So we need to, to understand, you know, what is the, the way that we're exploring life and what's the way that we're exploring it as individuals, as a collective, and how do we want to create change? You know, this is, again, going back to what I was saying, we can have a hypothetical future scenario where everything is a disaster, or we can have a future vision of a thriving, regenerative life on earth. My actions are going to be very different and my experience is going to be there very different depending on my vision for the future as well. And that's not about denying what's going on. That is not about, you know, repressing and not wanting to see what's going on. But it's about understanding, you know, that a lot of times I see in with a lot of activists, um, I see them so much in, in the fight now of wanting to change things that all that they are focusing is on is on what they don't want instead of on what they do want. Because one of the things that I see a lot is that we need each other. Like the system of alienation and of blaming others doesn't work to change things in the way that I think that we want to change them. <laughs> If, if we keep on, on separating and, and blaming others for, you know, like they are doing the best that they can with what they know. As I get a little bit older and a bit more nuanced in this space, I'm realizing there are, there are very few evil people 
And quite often people are people are responding to the same problems. And actually, you've got a lot in common and a lot in agreement, but maybe you differ in how to approach those problems. You differ in the solutions. And quite often we put ourselves on opposite ends and adversarial sort of ends. And we actually agree, but we we disagree in what should be done about it. And it's it's we're so close to being allies, but we fixate on on these on these differences. And I, I think that's why you're right in going in with that compassion and seeing like, oh, actually, you are 99% in agreement with me. It's just it's just we're doing things in a different way. Yes. Thank you so much, Brian. That was a really useful chat. Is there any final thoughts you wanted to leave us on? Yes, you know, I think that it's important to to honor our own experience, to have the time to honor that other people have other experiences and to understand that we have the capacity to be resilient, to be courageous, to take responsibility. We are capable, we are skillful people. We might have different skills and we need to find, you know, like how do we want to live today and what's the vision of that future? As I always say, like if I have a future that is a thriving regenerative image in my mind, where's the gap? You know, like how can I go towards there? How can I live today as if that is going to be the reality without denying what's going on? So a lot of times it's it's about this balance of being present, being with what is happening and having the tools to be with that and to understand everybody else is going through the same thing. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time, Brian. Thank you for, for talking with us. Thank you so much for, for having me. Some more great insights there, some more dealing with feelings, which I think is something that I have maybe trained away uh, because I... I don't know. They seem so ephemeral and sudden. I don't feel in control when I'm having strong emotions. I worry that I'm not making good decisions or making decisions, you know, ration in the moment. Uh, but I really liked what he said about sort of reacting versus responding and that it does it doesn't mean sort of making a making a decision in a in a moment of anger but maybe allowing a little bit more time to unpick that anger or, you know that's come from somewhere that's bubbled up from something some decision you're not privy to it within your conscious thought but some decision making process has taken place that has given you those emotions so yeah maybe that's something i was getting wrong you know that it's it is about processing them in a sort of reflective manner rather than just losing your temper in the moment, uh, which as I shared some of my past experiences, you know, there, there were certainly moments I could have given into anger or frustration and that actually would have done a lot of harm. But I really liked what was being said there about sort of reacting versus responding of expanding the present and sort of being in the moment. But that moment is quite large. You don't have to make anything in a, in a hurry. The, the blame and alienation doesn't work. We're seeing that a lot right now as people are galvanized in their little echo chambers and blaming people and making fun of them. It's, it's, not, it's not working. It's never changed anyone's mind, really. So mental health and a bit of philosophy seems to be the foundation of what we've talked about today. After all, this is Deco Stop. Uh, we're not talking about how we can save the world. We're talking about how the ecological crisis, how eco-anxiety is affecting us as individuals. So there's times in my life where eco-anxiety has certainly reached dangerous levels uh, and they've usually coincided with other life events, you know, bad breakups, death of a loved one, things like that, things that have depleted my mental reserve and give me a more negative outlook, which then starts to sort of bleed into everything else. So it's always in a combination with other challenges where uh, things have gotten particularly dark. So let's address the psychological elephant in the room. Uh, let's face them head on with someone who's been studying in this field for some time. I'm joined by Caroline Hickman, psychotherapist and lecturer at the University of Bath, working in the field of climate psychology. Her research focuses on eco-anxiety and distress about the climate and ecological crisis in children and young people globally. Caroline, thank you for coming on. You seem the perfect person to talk to about this. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for asking me. It's a little weird to be the perfect person to be talking about something so uncomfortable, but it is what I've spent a lot of time 
examining and talking with people about for over 10 years now. So, yeah. And I think we, it's good to address that discomfort. It needs to be looked at. It needs to be examined. We, we sort of pull away. I, th- I think one of the first things that, that came up in our conversations building up to this was was the idea that negative emotions must be eradicated and they're, in, they're a bad thing inherently. And, and you sort of put back that like, well, negative emotions are important and they're telling us something. Well, yeah. Okay. Where do I start? (laughs) (laughs) Display the whole field for me in one one sentence. (laughs) Uh, Well, the Western medical model. So let's start there. The Western medical model divides emotions and emotional experience or cognitive experience thinking into good or bad. And we frame things that way. So to put it very clumsily, happy is good. Healthy is good and depressed or anxious is bad. But quite honestly, have you really spent a month of your life where you've not felt anxious or depressed at some point? These are normal emotional everyday experiences. So the problem with that framing is we immediately don't know how to navigate those feelings, don't know how to cope with them, and then start up with a message to ourselves of there's something wrong with me because I'm depressed or we get anxious about our anxiety or we get depressed about the fact we're depressed, which makes it all 10 times worse. And then we can go even further and say there's something wrong with me or there's something wrong with you and you should cheer up. I shouldn't feel this way. Yeah. And what we're really doing deeply unhelpfully here is telling ourselves that how we're naturally feeling is the wrong way to feel, which then makes it infinitely worse. So there's a couple of ways to approach this. That's a positive psychology approach, which says these feelings are unacceptable. The reality is, is, yeah, they're uncomfortable, but they might make perfect sense. So when we apply that to climate change, the biodiversity crisis, what's going on in the world today, we measure mental health by looking at our capacity to respond to external reality. And to be honest, I would be quite concerned about someone that wasn't anxious about climate change. It makes absolute sense. So instead of saying, what's wrong with you? You've got climate anxiety. I would say, well, you've got climate anxiety because you care about what's going on in the world. And we want people to care. And you should be proud that you care, not be worried about the fact that you care or belittle yourself or shame yourself. Or, you know, we we say to people, oh, you shouldn't feel the way you do. But you do feel that way. So then you're left feeling ashamed that there's something wrong with you. (laughs) So we should be proud that we feel anxious and disturbed and distressed. But obviously, we don't want to just say, hey, it's great. You feel bad. We want to say, okay, and now what can we do with these difficult feelings? Because we need to be able to tolerate these feelings and make sense of them because they're meaningful. But the trick really is to not set up home in them. So visit the depression, understand the anxiety, feel these disruptive, difficult thoughts, because they're a natural product of what it means to be a human being in the world today. But learn to navigate them and find the meaning in them, because they're there for a reason. And then ultimately, and I think we'll probably talk more about this in a bit, they can help steer us in the right direction of what to do about this. So instead of cutting them away, we should be saying, welcome, you know, come and get involved in this. You know, we're not robots, we're human beings. And so feelings of uncertainty and anxiety and vulnerability make complete sense. Think about what we're facing, right? We're facing challenges that humanity has never faced before. Now, I'm going to give you a a little warning. Uh, I'm going to say some really uncomfortable things at the start of this conversation. (laughs) Uh, Think of me as the 13th fairy in Sleeping Beauty, you know? The 13th comes in and says, no, you're all going to die. Now, thankfully, they're able to tweak it to turn into your going to fall asleep. But that is a maturational process psychologically. These stories show us that life is full of struggle and hardship and we have to get stuck and we have to learn how to deal with these things. And what that gives us is emotional resilience and emotional intelligence, which matures us and shows us how to deal with hardship and adversity and not just see it as negative, but see it as opportunities for growth. So Yeah, humankind has never faced anything on this scale before. So let's go to the bottom line, psychologically. We have a human ego and we like to think that we can conquer everything, which is partly why we're in this mess in the first place. You know, our crops have got bugs. Oh, let's spray them. Let's dominate nature and make it work better (laughs) for us, be more efficient. 
that thinking, that Western thinking, Western mindset has led us down this very difficult path. And we're on this path and we really don't know how to deal with this. So this also might sound a bit strange, but if anybody tells you that they are the expert in climate psychology or eco-anxiety, don't listen to them. (laughs) Even though it's me saying that to you, I have immersed myself in this for over 10 years over 40 years of working in psychology and mental health, and I'm still just learning about this. And we need the humility and hubris to understand that because this is new. And so our existing psychological frames are not really up to the business and they keep falling short. Yeah, we're not very good at working on this scale. It's uh, it's almost the scale that seems to be overwhelming. We're, we're sort of a tribal, evolutionarily, we're a tribal species. Yeah. There's immediate family and then there's wider tribe. Mm-hmm. And these problems are so all consuming and require such such input. There's such like, it almost doesn't matter what I do as an individual. I need everyone to join in. Mm. We, we don't seem equipped with, with dealing with this. We, we're used to having a very direct impact on our environment. You know, we, we clear a field and plant a crop and now we're feeding our family and our on our tribe yeah. and, and that we could get our hands dirty and we could grab it and we could do something and this seems almost on a religious scale this is all consuming this is the planet mm. it is too big to see all at once you're absolutely right and because we can't see all of it all at once we try to reduce it to its component parts and we also try to reassure ourselves well we've dealt with previous challenges, previous threats, global threats. So let's use what we've done before. And then if we do that, it'll all work out. Trouble is it won't because we've never had anything on this systemic scale before. So yes, we've had world wars. Yes, we've had global threats. But if you think about, and COVID, and I promise you I'm not minimizing COVID, but if you think about the narratives that we use to develop hope, an optimism to get ourselves through that. We say things like, when we get over this, when we get beyond it, we can go back to normal. But we're too late. It's We're too far down the road when it comes to climate change. Even if we went to zero carbon emissions tomorrow, it's too late because of the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. So we will still see heat increasing. We will still see sea levels rising. We will still still see that developing, even if we took action tomorrow. The world is going to be different forever. Exactly. And the other thing is there is no place in the planet that is untouched by this because there's going to be whole parts of the world uninhabitable and those people have got to go somewhere. So there will be no way of people saying, oh, well, we'll be okay and taking a kind of individualistic, isolationist approach to this as a form of reassurance. And I'm sure Lots of people don't feel reassured by that. But if people do try to do that, it's actually going to have an even more detrimental impact. So you're absolutely right. It, this requires a shifting psychological mindset to see this as a planetary scale crisis and an existential crisis. But it's both personal and social and national and international and planetary all at the same time. We've never dealt with that before. So, of course, we're a bit lost. We haven't got the maps. But paradoxically, counterintuitively, I'm going to give you the good news. If we wake up to the fact that we haven't got the maps, we have a fighting chance to develop the maps because we can envisage our way forwards. We can use creativity. We can build new systems for dealing with this. But if we insist that we have superior knowledge already and we only have to reapply that, then we're in a lot of trouble. So it, that's why I say, if people say to you, you've, they've got the answer to climate anxiety, don't listen to them. Because we haven't because yet. Because that is arrogance. <laughs> well, we haven't yet, but we are learning. And if we're willing to learn and willing to listen to people with different ways of thinking, different ways of doing things, we would be capable of discovering the ways forwards. Yeah. Do you think if, if we wanted to put a sort of hopeful and motivating spin you laid in with saying that that actually hardships help us mature and help us learn yeah if we nail this will we one day look back and say we really grew through this like humanity it it looked like a crisis and it looked like a disaster in many ways it was but we grew and we became something bigger and maybe we had more of a, a global viewpoint from then on. And actually this could be a this could be a, a maturing process for us as a as a species. Absolutely. This is, you know, the title of the talks that I give. I say we're facing the difficult truths, plural, of the climate emergency. This is an apocalyptic disaster or it's a transformational moment in history. Oh, I like that. The thing about crisis is crisis always gives us opportunities for 
for maximum transformational growth. But if you avoid the crisis, then you just play safe and you never get that transformational change and Mm. you fail ultimately. So you're absolutely right. And transformation is completely different to change. Change is more about tinkering around the edges and just tweaking a few things. But transformation means you're completely radically changed from the inside out. Now, I don't want to put too positive a spin on it, but those are the kind of things that are available to us. And if we bring this back to climate anxiety, because I've not really defined it for you in the way that I think about it. Climate anxiety's got, of course, its roots in climate change and the biodiversity crisis. When we look at what's going on in the world and we look at the world that we love, it makes us very anxious and it makes us feel small and relatively powerless. So of course, anxiety is a very healthy response. It warns us that something's going on. But there's two things important things here. One is it doesn't stop there because with everyday anxiety, you would be able to address that anxiety and you would expect that anxiety to reduce. It's something you can grab. It's something you can you can interact with in your environment. Yes. And you can approach it and reduce it or treat it or rationalize it or, you know, you can move into a relationship with it in some kind of way. And very few people are stuck with lifetimes worth of anxiety, thankfully. Climate anxiety, this does not work because climate anxiety is only triggered by what we see going on in the world. And what it then leads to is this sense of living in a world that doesn't care about us, doesn't care about the planet, doesn't care about the plight of animals, doesn't care about the environment, doesn't care about the future of children, future generations. And that is causing infinitely more distress and despair than our anxiety about the climate crisis, because it's waking us up to the fact that we're living in a world that doesn't care. And if you think about our relationship with world leaders, whatever your politics, we elect politicians, we look to leaders around the world in whatever faith leaders, school leaders, anyone, and we invest in them and hope that they will take care of the population. We give them this kind of magical thinking, parental responsibility, and then they fail us, especially around climate change, because there's very few world leaders showing that they care about the population. So what that does is it gives you that sense of betrayal and that they just don't care about us. Teenagers are saying to me in therapy things like, tell me why I should want to live in a world that doesn't care about the future of children (laughs) and young people. Because what they're feeling is that hurt and betrayal of the very people who are supposed to care about us. There's a generational thing here. Are you seeing very different interpretations through through the different generations? Because you focus on, on young people, don't you? Well, I do, except, well, two things. I've stretched my definition of young people slightly because people in their early 30s keep saying yeah but I feel like this (laughs) so yeah we never stop developing exactly we (laughs) never stop growing so I've tried to think about it in terms of your carbon footprint your culpability what you've grown up in the knowledge of and these are generalizations so you have to forgive me but generally speaking people mid-30s and under have grown up with knowledge about climate change it's part of the norm whereas over 30s you kind of had to wake up to it So yeah, there's these generational differences of whether it's your norm or not, but it's also in terms of your culpability and whether you could have taken action sooner. But you don't want to kind of divide it into simplistic terms like that, because lots of older adults are also feeling very powerless and helpless and enraged and despairing. And lots of younger people can be oblivious. So it's not as simplistic as to say it's just divided along generational differences. A 10-year-old put it beautifully, He said, no, Caroline, you don't really get it. He said, you grew up thinking polar bears would be there forever. He said, I've grown up knowing they will go extinct. Whoa. (laughs) That's the difference, right? Mm. He's had to grow up knowing that. So that's part of his landscape emotionally, intellectually, ecologically, he holds that knowledge. And okay, maybe a few polar bears will adapt or, you know, survive. But polar bears, as we've known them, will not make it. Mm. So he's had to incorporate that knowledge and find a way to tolerate that. But my generation genuinely assumed they would be there forever. So I had to wake up to the fact that maybe they wouldn't be. And then, oh, no, 
they're really not going to be. So uh, different layers of understanding and guilt and responsibility and culpability and shame. Older generations are often feeling much more ashamed, whereas younger generations, oh, these are horrible generalizations, are often left feeling, well, it's not fair. Yeah, you've left me with this. Now I've got to deal with it. Yeah, and and people are saying, don't fly, don't eat meat. Well, you did. Mm. That's not fair. So I think it's complicated to have these intergenerational conversations and explore the intergenerational differences. But I wouldn't want to divide it into two simplistic divisions because I think that in itself is looking for a quick fix and that's not helpful. Yeah, it's a spectrum and it's a it's a distribution graph. It but... really is. And at the centre of this look, it's relational. So if I'm going to say one thing about any of this, it's all relational. So it's relational in terms of how we relate to our own emotions and feelings and thoughts. It's relational in terms of how we frame it with culture culpability and relationship with others. It's relational in terms of our relationship with the planet, whether we see the planet as something to exploit or to, you know, be grateful that we are part of and protect and preserve. It's relational in terms of nations and the international picture. So long as we keep looking at it in those relational terms, that will help us navigate and find a way through it. And it's relational in terms of the mix of emotions we feel, because the anxiety is often the first one, but then it often then transforms into depression, despair, hopelessness, helplessness. But these are all emotionally, mentally healthy responses to what's going on. And a lot of people push back on this and say, well, okay, but depression is not very nice. And how can that be a healthy response? And I would say, well, again, don't get stuck in it, but we should feel sad. We should feel regret. We should feel frustration and then transform that back to our transformation into something. But how do we do that? Well, we can transform it through grief and a sense of loss of what we've losing, what we've given up, how we didn't take action. And now that should spur us onto action today. And that helps us develop radical hope. And radical hope is a sense of, well, we might be going off a cliff, but we can go down fighting. Radical hope is, it is awful. And there is a lot we can do. So we don't split it into either or. Either it's all going to be okay, or it's going to be terrible, right? We need to hold the tension between those two opposite positions. And people often kind of accuse you of being, or me, or anyone, of being, you know, nihilistic, doom and gloom, catastrophic thinking. Fear mongers, that's the other one. We've got to have hope. We've got to have optimism, right? Now I'm going to just destroy that argument, if you don't mind. Oh, yes, please. I get it a lot. <laughs> because it's a really annoying argument because, it, again, it's splitting optimism and hope into this is good and doom and gloom. You know, it's leveled as a accusation as bad. Well, no, it's really, really not. Because ironically, both of those positions are the human ego attempting to take back control. If I am convinced it'll all be okay, I'm back in control. If I'm convinced it's hopeless, doom and gloom, it's going to be, you know, an apocalypse, I'm back in control. Do you see what I mean? Mm. This is the ego attempting to regain control, right? And the ego is sneaky and will do it in any way it can possibly do. It needs finites. It needs, it's either this or this. It needs certainty. Yeah. Because I feel it, it, it's still a sort of form of anxiety, but it is, it is maybe that flip coin and it's almost sort of putting a wall up defensively. The weird hostility that, that is felt being vegetarian like 10 years ago and the weird like hostility that I'd face that I didn't sort of seem relevant. You know, it, I'd, I'd bring it up and it would be like, oh God, vegetarian, you're constantly going <laughs> on about it. And it's like, well, we're, we're picking where to eat. It's relevant. Mm -hmm. And it seems to almost be deep down, deep down, there's an acceptance that it's probably the right thing to do. And then people feeling shamed and lashing out. And I feel like it's, it's, we're seeing the same with sort of climate activism and, and any sort of activity in this space. Mm. And it's maybe not a problem with the people. Maybe it's a problem internally that's making them feel that way. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Look at the rage that was directed at Greta Thunberg and the other young climate activists when they were first out on the streets. It was disproportionate, insane destructive rage. It's impossible to square that. I mean, displaying rage towards children, there's nothing to make that acceptable. And yet people thought that their rage towards her, I don't like her, I hate her. You've never met her. 
oh, she's smug. She's smug. She's condescending. Oh. And it's all weird projection. It's, I think that's all coming from you, dude. You've just done my job for me. It's a massive projection. But it's it's a malign projection, not a benign projection, which means I can kill you and feel justified. It's every other day that a climate activist is being murdered somewhere in the world. Every other day, there's a climate activist murdered. There's a a sense of, and it's a weird rationalization and justification that these people who are fighting to save the planet for everybody somehow can have this rage and terror directed at them. And it's an irrational rage and terror. And that is climate anxiety in action. So what's behind that disproportionate rage is people's climate terror. So climate anxiety, we've missed the boat on calling it something better because it's in popular use. And I'm never going to complain about anything that gets people talking about emotion. But a lot of people are not happy with the phrase because a lot of young people in particular say to me, it's climate terror. Hmm. And terror drives people into non-rational, non-human behavior. So you're touching the edges of that when you announce that you're vegetarian or that you don't eat meat even or don't drink cow's milk or not prepared to fly anymore. Because what you're doing is waking people up to their climate anxiety. And rather than face their own climate anxiety, they would rather shut you up Mm. and silence you either through dismissing you or getting angry with you or shaming you, because it's much easier to feel they're emotionally regulating themselves by silencing you rather than saying, oh, yeah, as soon as you say you're vegetarian, oh, it makes me think, oh, I should be really, but I still like eating meat. So (laughs) I'm going to struggle with that dilemma. And you've just woken up in me. Damn you, because you've just bought my dinner. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. That would be them processing the complexity of that emotion. If you want to eat meat, choose to eat meat. If you're going to feel uncomfortable about it, tolerate those feelings of discomfort and grow up. Yeah. Don't attack people who choose not to eat meat. You see that played out all the time. And there's these whole range of defenses about people's climate anxiety. There's a little bit of pure climate denial going on out there, but not that much anymore. Mostly what we see is disavowal, where people say, oh yeah, I really care about the planet, but oh, I like my burgers. Or, oh, thank God COVID's over. I want to fly to New York to go shopping for Christmas. And you think, oh, hang on. How can those two things coexist in the same mind? So on the one hand, you acknowledge that you're worried and concerned, which makes you a nice person. And on the other hand, you then minimize that concern and that distress, or you attack others and try and silence them. We've got a whole range of defenses against this. The reality is, if I'm honest, is as far as I'm concerned, everyone on the planet has climate anxiety. Everyone. How can you not? Except maybe that very, very small group of psychological sociopaths that exist in the world (laughs) who don't genuinely care about anything, right? But they are genuinely a very small group of people. Everyone else has climate anxiety, but they don't all know that they've got it. So I'm using a psychological frame that includes the unconscious. So we're not using positivist psychology that says, oh, we are purely conscious creatures. We are always choosing what we do in life, right? If we were, there would be no war, there would be no poverty, there would be no child abuse. We are frequently very unconscious creatures. So this is a depth psychology approach. And that framing says we are largely unconscious and then things bubble up into consciousness and that makes us stressed and anxious and we can either push it back down and repress it or deny it or suppress it. And we don't see how it got there. And we don't know how Just it got a, there. Just a feeling bubbles up and it's like, deal with this now. It's like, I don't understand the mechanics. Well, it got there because you said you were a vegetarian. <laughs> yeah. That's how it got there. Because I said out loud what your voice is saying inside. Exactly. <laughs> So you did that to me, so I'm going to attack you rather than deal with my own anxiety or deal with the dilemma around the fact that I don't want to deal with my anxiety because I want to be able to rationalize and justify eating meat, flying wherever I want for the rest of my life and not have any consequences. Well, yeah, you go ahead, but do it consciously because it'll feel uncomfortable and that might lead you to make different choices some of the time. I'm not sitting here holier than thou and saying, 
nobody should ever eat meat. I'm sitting here saying, make a conscious choice and understand the consequences of eating meat. And there are plenty of other plenty of other avenues where I'm failing. Like in moving out here, I have no choice but to to fly back when I want to visit family. And it right. might be something I only do every few years and it, it sort of certainly factors into it. Yeah. But um, there's plenty of things I know I could be doing better and plenty of areas that I feel guilty with, but I engage with that. Paul Hoggett, who was one of the founders of the Climate Psychology Alliance, coined the phrase love miles rather than air miles. And he says, if you're flying for love, it's totally different than if you're flying to go shopping. Because maintaining those loving relationships is an important part of being human, finding meaning and being in the world today. And frankly, if we don't do that, then we've lost the battle with the climate crisis anyway, right? No one wants to live in that world. So do it consciously, make conscious choices and reframe it as love miles. This is... A little bit of a stage where I am right now. This is really speaking to me. So really? I'm going to have to go and sit and look out a window with a coffee, maybe. Oh, you should. <laughs> and have a think. <laughs> you should. Well, what I would honestly say is sit with your back against a tree and ask the tree to tell you what to do. And listen, ask the land what to do. Ask the ocean what to do. Because we need that partnership with the environment. Because humans have caused this. Humans have to address this. But we're not just addressing it for humans. We're doing this for the earth. This is partnership with the natural world. And there's some comfort in it. I'm not saying you get all the answers. But it helps reduce that sense of isolation. And it helps reduce that idea. Because I think humans, we get very caught up in we can never do enough. And then this is terrifying and then we feel bad and then we feel we should do more. And But you know what? You can't fix it on your own. You can only fix it in partnership, in relationship with others. And those others includes the trees. There's a beautiful American Indian teaching story about who speaks for the wolf. It's a beautiful story of this tribe living in this beautiful valley and the tribe grows. So they get together and they say, okay, half of us are going to go and find another valley. And they find this amazing valley with trees and grass and rivers and loads of food they can kill. And then they realize that there are wolves living in that valley. So then they've got a real dilemma. Do they compete with the wolves for the prey? Do they kill the wolves so they can have all the prey? Do they put a wall up? around where they live to keep the wolves out and so on. And they kind of wake up to the fact they don't want any of those solutions because they would lose their humanity. They would lose their soul. Yeah, okay, they might have the prey, but is that nice to the wolves, you know? So they go back to the original tribe and explain this and discuss it. And what they learn is that as humans, as a tribe, they should not make choices about their future without somebody in the tribe speaking on behalf of the other creatures they share the planet with. So when they have tribal council, they will ask, who speaks for the wolf? What do the wolves want? Who speaks for the bison? Who speaks for the grass? Because they should get a vote in what we do. And if we included them in that, we would make very different decisions. It'd be interesting to integrate that into our parliament. You've essentially got the Lorax. Well, that's exactly what we should do. And that's what a lot of eco-psychology argues for the rights of the river and giving legal protection, trying to make ecocide a law. Yeah, that's going on in New Zealand. We, we have a, a river with personhood. I know you do. It's fabulous. And if we got ecocide into the law in the same way as genocide, it would change everything. So that's about moving into right relationship with the other creatures that we share the planet with. And it would stop us just throwing rubbish off boats, thinking it'll just disappear. Or deep sea mining, because it won't matter, because it's out of sight. Yeah, we would have to ask the creatures that live there what they want. And we would have a very different outcome, wouldn't we? You'd at least have to acknowledge these things in the decision-making process. You couldn't pretend it wasn't there. Yeah, I think a lot of eco-anxiety comes about because that's the price we pay of trying to pretend that those things don't matter. Mm -hmm. And what it creates, it breaks our hearts because that disconnection from the natural world, that loss of relationship with nature creates so much distress, so many mental health problems. There's an author called Jay Griffiths who writes brilliantly about this. She's written a book called Kith, and she basically asks the question, you know, how come so many European American children have got so much distress and mental health difficulties 
compared to children and young people in Indigenous tribes. It's incomparable and not being completely oversimplistic about it, but a lot of it is that loss of place, loss of meaning, loss of relationship with the land, loss of duty to the land, loss of respect to the land. And it doesn't just hurt the land, it hurts us. Solastalgia is, we talk about eco-anxiety, but solastalgia is a form of distress where we are grieving the loss of our connection to the land, to the place that we love. There was recently an iconic tree cut down here in the UK, the Sycamore Gap. Yeah. And what happened? The whole country grieved. Yeah. Well, that was a perfect representation of what we need to do for all the trees, all the oceans, all the fish. That attachment that people had to that one tree, we need to re-engage that attachment to the oceans, to the land. Amazing. Thanks so much for for giving so much of your time actually so for coming on i think that was that was challenging in the great way <laughs> and i'm re- i'm really i'm ready to grow from that so thanks so much for coming on and, and talking with you're us you're really welcome i mean oh, struggling with this stuff you're in good company we should struggle with this stuff and link it to human rights because that paradoxically can save us thank you caroline thank you so much for your time my pleasure take care And what an interview to end on. Just as a little side point, I mentioned being veggie just as an example of a jumping off point where I've seen some strong reactions in people that I didn't know where they were coming from. Uh, No worries at all if you're not. I am honestly not being judgy. My own son isn't. There's someone I have complete control over. So if I did want to force people to be veggie, I could force him to be veggie. But no, it's up to him. He'll get to decide when he's a little bit older. So I'm not going to force you either. All I will ask is really enjoy it. You know, appreciate the meat you're eating. It is a real treat. So enjoy it. Cook it well. Savor it. I found a lot of what we've discussed today challenging. I am certainly still on this journey as well, and we'll have to keep an eye on mental reserves. And if things are becoming a little bit unhealthy, there were certainly some aspects that I, I don't know, I disagree with, but I think that maybe is an area for me to have a little bit of growth. Um, I have a conflict between being personally healthy and in a good place and being effective. I don't want to become inert. I don't want to become a sort of shaman on the mountaintop in complete inner peace, but not actually doing anything. <laughs> and I think we touched upon sort of maintaining that healthy balance that you you need a little bit of anxiety to to drive you and to to stimulate you to sort of make change, but you still have to be healthy and effective. And if you are sucking all joy from your life or all enjoyment from life, then that's sort of not good either. If we're going to save the world, it's got to be one worth living in. So things like the 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 love miles relieved me of a lot of guilt um, because the only way I'm going to be able to see my family is with some some very carbon heavy flights um and i'm going to try and change other aspects of my life to to address that um and try not to feel too guilty about it because there are certainly people i miss and would like to see Another theme that came up today was different viewpoints and a sort of Western bias to a lot of these feelings. So there there are cultures less tied up in eradicating negative elements of the human experience and of being so detached and sealed off from nature. And so that would certainly make a good future episode. That's something I've been learning a lot about behind the scenes and I've quite enjoyed. So I'd love to share some of that insight with you maybe in a future episode. As a little encouraging thing to to leave you with, without becoming a a toxic, positive person, it's really worth looking into things where we have all banded together and what we can achieve when we do. So things like the CFC bans, uh, single-use plastic. I can remember within a few years, no more plastic bags blowing around on the roads, no more courting trees and things like that. I know it's a little bit annoying that you, you have to remember to bring your bags, but it's It made the places we live in so much nicer so quickly. And we're seeing it here, actually, in the new place where I live in Wellington is rewilding. It's it's becoming sort of predator free. And and weirdly, that means a lot of trapping and killing of invasive animals, unfortunately. But these critically endangered species are now just thriving and just turning up. The critically endangered caca, a type of alpine parrot, there's five of them on my window ledge. (laughs) one morning and they're just everywhere. So it's just, there are places where we're winning. There are places where things are coming back. Really do look into the history of CFCs. Um, it's a bit of a bit of an older story now. So basically to give you the cliff notes, in 1974, Sherwood Rowland and Mario Molina predicted that CFCs would lead to the loss of the world's ozone layer. And 
over half of the ozone layer over Antarctica had gone in just that decade. Then in 1987, so quite a delay, but more than 30 countries agreed to phase them out through the Montreal Protocol. And it was just a great example of the world coming together and the world tackling something. So we put some links in the show notes as well. Uh, there's a nice little Latin bro, just five minute long summation of that thing. So I think it's worth holding the incredible things we are capable of doing when we all do pull together. And for some reason, that like, I, I love watching sort of space exploration stuff. There was a there was a documentary recently about the James Webb Telescope and how how many failure points there were and how many people came together to do that. You can see the things that disappoint you in the, in humanity, but it's worth pointing at the things as well that we do really well and what we can achieve when we do work together and how positive that is. I, I weirdly like space exploration stuff. It gets me all motivated that we can we can not be selfish. We can do good things. So just to wrap things up, I wanted to say a quick thank you to, well, Georgia as ever, who uh, edits and puts together our show and does a lot of the scheduling, but also to Shona Riddle, who is an intern working with me at the moment, who helped me with some of the background research on our guests. We also now have a support us page to keep the podcast going. Lots of ways you can help the show from the free, like leaving a review, subscribing, put it on in the car, subject people to it. Actually, I, I know a lot of people put it on in their lab as well. So h- hello, victims of my voice. <laughs> um, but yeah, tell people about the show if you enjoy it. Uh, give us feedback if there's anything you don't enjoy and maybe it's something we can tweak. I'm getting lots of suggestions for episodes from listeners. So I find that really useful because I have my favorites. I don't want to be too fishy or neglect technology and things like that. There's lots of things that encompass the deep sea after all it's most of the planet. So give me some ideas. So I'm not worried that I'm just telling you about the things I think are cool because there are cool things that I don't even know about yet. And I'd like the chance to learn on the support us. It goes right the way up to sort of buying some merch and being a patron. I'm still amazed by how cool the Patreons are and that people are just willing to to support the show and a nice little community is going on now on the Discord. And uh, over Christmas, we had our first little get together. So both me and Alan hopped on a Zoom call and uh, yeah, we, we called it the Take Our Podcast to Work Day. So Alan was able to give a little tour of the vessel and the sub and I was able to introduce people to some fish from the fish collection here at Tapapa. If you were interested in the things that our guests were saying, you'd like to know more, you'd like to sort of learn more about them, then there's lots of links in the show notes. They're all quite open and they publish and share quite a lot. So if you would like to learn more within this space, then there's certainly plenty of places to jump off for there. And so until the next time, we'll deep see you next time and I miss you already. If you would like to advertise with the Deep Sea Podcast, feel free to get in touch. Our audience is primarily young people with an interest in science, often undergraduates or people considering a degree in marine science, but it also includes established scientists. Feel free to get in touch if you're interested in reaching these groups.